and gentlemen, second time, warm welcome from my side for this uh, second panel of uh, the 2019 Riga conference, which is about comprehensive and collective, building the foundation of NATO's future. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, to see so many familiar faces. It has become really a family thing, the Riga conference. Uh, it's always good to be here, not only to see old friends, to make new friends, but also to listen to what is going on in the region and what important partners have to say, especially in terms of security. So therefore, uh, it's my real pleasure to welcome this brilliant panel for today. On my first left side, it's uh, Ms. Annegret kram karrenbauer the Defense Minister of Germany. Next to her, it's uh, Adris Papkris, who is the as everybody knows, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defence of the Republic of Latvia, so it's a home play for him. Uh, great to have you and to have us with you here. Thanks for the invitation to come in here. And next to him, on my outer left side, it's Peter Hultqvist, who is the Defence Minister of Sweden. And uh, maybe I keep talking for another 15 seconds so that everybody can take seats. That would be brilliant, because otherwise, it's just that we lose the time and you lose the time to listen to what we basically have to say about this. Um, and I mean, it's kind of a diplomatic uh, question how to start. And I thought the best thing is to start um, with the host, not only for the issue of being polite, but also it's about Baltic security and it's about Nordic security. That's the reason why we are here. So. Maybe my first question to you is, can you give us the, the outlook as a, as a frontline state? How has security developed in this region? So what should we be aware about? Me, I'm now speaking as somebody who's not from the region, who's looking at it, but uh, can you give us an, kind of an, of an update where we stand and how do you see the security threats for the moment in the region? Well, we live in the intervined world, so um, our situation in the Baltic Sea region and in Baltics and in, in whole Northern Europe is probably very much also uh, in connection with the things which happen in other regions. And um, if I'm looking to the name of this panel uh, about NATO future, uh, then uh, I'm somehow thinking also about uh, our General Secretary of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, and um, I'm thinking what, what kind of characteristics he should have at this stage. And I would wish probably that he would take an example, if not uh, from uh, Emperor Meiji, then at least from uh, Turkish Ataturk, uh, because uh, I think what is important for NATO, uh, from our perspective, is that we preserve the fundamental tradition of NATO as a strong alliance militarily as it was built after the Second World War, and at the same time, uh, by keeping this military conservatism and political conservatism, it can also be evolved into a very modern alliance capable to face all the modern threats. Why it is important for us? Because we here in the Baltics, we are a litmus test for many things which are or might happen uh, to our allies, with our allies, or in the territory of our allies, uh, further to the West. Um, and uh, our security here in the region is very much based on, on this hard security which NATO always provided, also during the Cold War, and also on understanding that these modern challenges uh, what we here in the region are facing daily. If we are looking to this, this year alone, we were counting um, in our offices how many, for instance, different kind of cyber attacks we had. I think in Latvian territory we had about 6,000 cyber attacks up to now, and this is not all over. Of course, not all of them were coming from some, some third powers or from outside, but many of them did. We also speak about fake news, we also speak about energy security, and this is exactly where we showed ourselves as a litmus test, because if you look to the Baltic countries as an example, then uh, precisely because of this, we have three NATO Excellence Centers here, which is Excellence Center for Cybersecurity, 
because Estonians were the first ones which were attacked in 2007. We have excellent center for energy because we still continue to pay for gas uh, more than our friends in Germany are paying because Russian gas doesn't have an um, economic price, it has a political price. And uh, we are daily facing different type of fake news and different type of propaganda channels on our territories because uh, media and social networks do not know the borders. So we have a NATO Excellence Center of Strategic Cooperation. So in short, in a nutshell, we want to preserve conservatively what we had up to now, and we have to live up, up to the new channel challenges timely. Okay, thanks very much for the comprehensive overview of the challenges that we are facing here. Minister Kram Karrenbauer, there's always spots on Germany on these things. The question is, as you know, I get it from this reason, from this region. Can we trust the Germans? So, what can, <laughs> no, it's, I mean, you are laughing, but that's. Uh, I mean, if we stand outside, the question is always, especially as as the Americans are, maybe not longer the hundred percent guarantor of security. The eyes go around and ask, so who could it be? And Germany is a long-standing partner for this region, uh, but uh, it's always uh, as you described when we, when we talked outside, it's always a challenge, even domestically, to, to sell that we have partners up here in the north. So what can we expect from Germany for doing for northern security? First of all, let me say it clearly, you can trust us and you can do it. And uh, so first of all, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's great to be here in beautiful Latvia, my first time is this distinguished conference and um, I'm looking forward to our exchange of ideas and perhaps just three remarks to kick us off. The first remark should go without saying, but since it's my first visit here as Defense Minister, I would like to be clear. Germany's commitment to NATO is rock solid, and especially Germany's commitment to Article 5 is unshakable. I think it's, it's, a, it's an important message here in the Baltic Sea. My country understands as well as any what it means to be part of this alliance. We are grateful for the security, freedom and unity that NATO has brought us. This year, let me say this, we not only celebrate 70 years of NATO, we but also celebrate 30 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the liberation of Central and Eastern Europe. And without NATO, without the steadfast solidarity of the Allies, that would not have happened. And as a country that has benefited so much from the alliance, Germany takes very seriously that we need to contribute substantially to NATO's success as well. Hence, my second remark in the debate about fair burden sharing in NATO, we must come to a balanced understanding of the three C's, cash, capabilities and contributions. Yes, it is important that all NATO allies move toward at least 2% of GDP and in their defense spending. And our alliance needs proper investments. And yes, I readily admit that Germany needs to do more in this regard. But since 2014, we have been moving in the right direction and we have a solid plan with specific projects to achieve 1.5% by 24 and build on that towards 2% in the years until uh, 31. We do so in full accordance with the NATO planning process. But we also need to look at capabilities and contributions. And I'm proud of what German soldiers contribute to Alliance security. Just yesterday, I visited the German troops leading the EFP battle group in Lithuania. Germany has consistently been the second largest troop contributor to our common effort in Afghanistan. And Germany is the second largest troop contributor to NATO overall. Germany leads the 
reach ATF 2019, and we will do so again in 2023, I think. Germany is a leading nation at the multinational command of East in Poland. And we are establishing NATO's new logistics hub in the south of Germany in Ulm. I could go on, but the main point for me is this. In assessing every ally's contribution to the common effort, we must not look at cash ratios alone. I stand, let me say this, for Germany that is a reliable partner, fulfilling its international responsibilities. And Germany that does not say no reflexively whenever a new task is being discussed. But a Germany that acts always in accordance with our allies and our common interests and values. And the third and final thought, security is not only a matter of military means, especially in light of hybrid threats. We need to pursue a comprehensive approach, as my colleague said, and that is what we are doing. But in order to increase our effectiveness and resilience, NATO and the EU need to cooperate even more closely. That means strengthening the European pillar of NATO. Now, some of you have been doing their jobs for much longer than I do and I have. And you will be telling me that idea is yesterday's news and will hardly come to anything. But I think it is the right to not expect too much. The EU is facing its own troubles, on not just because um, of Brexit. And there are some roadblocks in the relationship between NATO and the EU that will not be swiftly overcome. But it is also true that our institutions are natural partners and that the EU has made significant progress in the last few years. I am thinking of especially the PESCO projects and the European Defence Fund and also of very concrete steps, for example, on military mobility. I would like to see an even deeper cooperation on addressing hybrid threats and challenges in cyberspace, as well as the realm of contested information. By broadening the areas of cooperation, we will open doors for countries that are not members of both EU and NATO, such as Sweden, that will strengthen European security for all of us. Thanks very much. As we're talking of Sweden, Minister Hulquist, it has been said that Sweden may not be part of NATO, but it is a kind of very important part of European security, be it from a political point of view as well as from a military strategic point of view. How could Sweden contribute to European security? What is the perspective from, from Stockholm on this? Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today and uh, also try to explain the Swedish position and what we are trying to do in our part of Europe alone and together with others. Uh, the Swedish parliament has uh, directly connected to the security development in our neighborhood with experience of uh, Russian aggression against uh, Georgia 2008 annexation of Crimea 2014 and the ongoing conflict and war in uh, Ukraine and also all the things that happen in our neighborhood on the Baltic Sea with uh, close flyings to our aircrafts and uh, different sort of behavior that uh, from time to time make the tension a little bit higher. We have made the conclusion that we now are going from uh, defense forces that were were directed for international operations to national defense. And that means that we, in May 2015, decided to upgrade the Swedish uh, uh, <coughs> defense forces in a new trend. And I think we, uh, between 2015 and 2020, we'll invest 3 billion euro in defense. And uh, now we also have an agreement that we, during 2022 until 2025, will invest 5 billion crowns 
each year, the amount will be 20 billion crowns 2025. And this is to upgrade our weapon system, procure new weapon systems, to expand the procurement system we have, uh, expand the conscription system we have in, in the Army and Navy and Air Force, and um, also exercise on a higher level than we have done before. Uh, to, to upgrade national military capability is number one in our pillar and our defense strategy. The next position is that we are deepening our cooperation with others. We are very integrated now, Sweden and Finland. We are working a lot together with the exercises, with information sharing. We also have built a naval unit together that we also can use if it's needed. We have um, so many activities together and we also have war, war, planning beyond peace together. But we also have now deeper links with Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, Netherlands, United Kingdom, and United States. And we also are in the Enhanced Opportunity Program in NATO. And I think that what we are doing with our international exercises <coughs> is to build interoperability. Cold response is a way of, cold response exercise is a way of building interoperability. Trident Juncture is the same. And our exercise with around 20,000 soldiers, uh, Aurora, is also a way to build interoperability. And um, Belltops, Baltic Protector, and all these other activities is also the same, has also the same goal. Uh, I think that this cooperation, when we are building this interoperability, the, the way of acting together in reality, that is a key, and that is very, very strategic, and it's very important, because that is a real signal that we hire the threshold, and it's a security signal that we're ready to do something together. When I meet conscript soldiers in Sweden and uh, our units on different sort of exercises, I always tell them that you should not only see the things you are doing just now here. You, you must see what you are doing is connected to a broader scenario, a broader security scenario where, where we are sending out signals. Another example that was very clear was the Northern Wind exercise up in the northern part of Sweden with 4,600 soldiers from Norway, 1,600 from, from Finland, and 3,000 from Sweden, and also, also troops from Britain and United States. That was a very clear security signal for the defense of the northern part of our area. If we build this, this uh, interoperability, we also build a higher threshold, we, we, we make it very clear for if there are an aggressor that are interested that we are ready to defend ourselves together. But it's also very important to build up the national capability to show that we take the, to take the situation very seriously. Uh, because investing in different sort of weapon system, directly investing to upgrade the capability, it's a real way to show that we take this seriously. Mm. So th this is the two pillars. I think that uh, we, have a, we have a Nordic Solidarity Declaration, and we also are, uh, we have this 42.7 in the Lisbon Treaty, and we also delivered to France when, uh, when they asked us and other countries connected to the terrorist attack in, in Paris. So, so we have also this commitments on an international level. But I cannot see that um, if something happened in the Nordic countries or in the Baltics, I cannot see that it not will have an effect on all of us. I think it will, will have that result. Because of that, it was also very important for us to, to, to inaugurate a new regiment on the island of Gotland. Because um, what happened on Gotland, a direct impact on the Baltic states, on Finland and on the Swedish mainland. Mm. In a conflict or crisis situation in um, the Baltic Sea, Gotland will be a main goal for a different sort of interest. And that is Swedish territory. And we think because of that, we also need permanent 
uh, military representation. And uh, we are now preparing for a new defense bill. And um, I don't know if I say too much now, but I think there will be a majority in the parliament for more investments on the island of Gotland. If anybody wants to criticize me for, because I know saying this, they have to do that, but that's my position. And I hope that most of the political parties agree. I see them sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're watching carefully. Yeah, they're watching me now. Um, <laughs> we, we, we will, we take the situation seriously. We try to deliver in exercises, in investments, and in real cooperation. But we, all, we are, as Finland, non-allied, and Finland have a long border to Russia. They are also a front state with another history, another background. But our view is that if we change our, our security doctrine, we'll also have a new security situation with more of tension here. But we are not naive. We have seen what's happened in Ukraine, Crimea, Georgia. We must upgrade, we must cooperate. If it's needed, we have to act also, have the possibility to do it together. Thank Thanks you. very much. Maybe I can um, dip into especially the last part. It, it's interesting that you have a parliamentary majority, but we also see that the societies play a significant role in all these things. So the change of policy that you described, the increase of budget, what is the domestic debate beyond the kind of the elite circles of decision makers? Does the public uh, accept this course that, that you just described? I can say that when we decided to reactivate the conscription service system in Sweden, the reaction externally was very clear because there was article about it in Australia, in United States, in Russia, in, in, in Latin America, in China, in Africa, all over the world. We saw articles around this. And, and I got many questions about this when I have visited other countries. In Sweden, I think we have a broad support for, for this decision among people. I think that the soul of Sweden is conscription connected to, 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 air def to, to armed forces. The soul of Sweden is not professional organization. But now we have both. We have professionals and we have conscripts. And I hope that we can upgrade the amount of conscripts. I feel that we have a broad support among the Swedish people for, for this. This is not an, it's not any debate around conscription service in Sweden. Maybe from time to time it's a debate how, how high will the level be. Mm. Th th that's the only thing I can see. I don't know if you agree with me, but... <laughs> I have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how is the situation here in this country? Is this a widespread support for what you described as being the threat and being the policy? Well, I think we have a um, certainly relatively good understanding about uh, societal views in Latvia. And especially after uh, Russian attack on Crimea in 2014, we could see a surge of uh, people's understanding of security and, and need, for instance, to join National Guard to uh, pay more for our defense from GDP. And um, just like uh, my colleague Peter told uh, also here, we are uh, renewing also our system of security. And uh, yes, we do rely, and we trust Germans, and we do rely on uh, NATO fifth paragraph and fourth paragraph and third paragraph, and we believe in NATO solidarity. Uh, we don't believe in neutrality because, uh, you know, there have been a certainly very short period of time in the 30s where Latvia have been declaring neutrality, but to be a neutral, that basically means also to be accepted by others, to be a neutral country or territory. It never happened with us. We were never perceived as somebody who could stay out. Mm. We have been always invaded. So yes, one leg to keep a balance is not enough. So NATO solidarity is fine. But since 2014, we have been working on so-called comprehensive state um, defense system. So uh, we basically want to see our country as a hedgehog with needles uh, for any hypothetical opponent who would like to touch 
us to know that uh, they might uh, get a very painful feeling in their fingers. So uh, please don't do this. And that would mean also that we have two fundamental legs on what our security is based and should be based in future, within future NATO. So one is hard security of uh, NATO solidarity. Another part is that we at home here should do as much as we can to make society prepared for any types of crisis. I'm not speaking here just about hypothetical war, but I'm speaking rather about about internal consensus solidarity, where on the one hand, all our military forces uh, are in good touch and understanding with civil society, individuals and NGOs, and with our industries, entrepreneurs and business people. So we know that in the event of crisis, what kind and what type of uh, excavators are available, what types of cars are available, who would evacuate and help our kindergartens and children, which schools are available, so what is our territory about? And uh, people also should not be, of course, scared once we talk about this. But uh, we here being on the border of European Union and NATO, we cannot afford the wishful thinking. So that also means that we have to be very realistic. And um, as far as our defense system from the military side, um, we saw after the invasion in Ukraine not only an increase of volunteers, uh, but we also have been doing very much to prepare our National Guard, because our defense system is basically standing on, on three facets. One is our professionals, professional army, which at this moment is around 6,500. It will grow eventually to 7,500. Then we have a National Guard, at this moment about 8,500. We want it to grow to about 12,000, mm. and a reserve, people who have been serving in the military after we regain our independence, it's maybe around three, 4,000 people. And uh, if I speak about National Guard, I have a big respect to these individuals, these citizens, because they have been the first ones who joined our military formations after we renewed independence of Latvia. Uh, so they have been risking with the things already in those early days in the 90s, in the last century. But today, uh, I mean, they are in many ways um, devoting their free time, their money, what they could earn maybe in private entrepreneurship or, or businesses, for military training to be ready to stand for their values, to stand for Latvian nation, for our country, for democracy. And um, according to the latest statistics, about 25% of our National Guard are uh, training yearly, maybe more than 30 days per year, which means they give to our society and country one month from 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to appreciate that. So first of all, it tells something about their military preparedness. And secondly, uh, we have been trying to appreciate that also in different other ways. For instance, uh, our parliament uh, at the beginning of this year passed um, uh, a law that those who have so much of training they can get at the end of the year uh, one salary of months uh, as an addition, as a bonus for uh, this devotion um, to uh, service. Uh, differently from uh, uh, Swedish uh, example, we are not at this moment considering to introduce uh, uh, conscription or cons con uh, compulsory service because uh, you know, we have been living under the conscription and uh, different uh, guardianship of outside regime for a very long time. So in our public, there is a natural resistance to anything which is enforced. And I think with our National Guard, uh, voluntary approach, we have very high motivation. And uh, we also see this as a volunteer part, so I think what is important in defense, it's really motivation. So if people are motivated to stand for the values, to stand for the country, it is, a, it is much better than if they will start to argue that state system is asking something from them to do me that or do that. Mm. So uh, I know from my own experience, and I think uh, at this moment, uh, our system is uh, maybe very well fit for those uh, challenges uh, which we are posing. And the last thing, not to take too much time away from others also, I think it is extremely important, once I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, uh, there's also those new challenges. Those new challenges are not always just straight military. Uh, 
They are coming through social media, they're coming in general uh, towards general public, and um, we have to make our societies to be more resilient, to be more, um, let's say, cognitive in analyzing the situation. And in the current world, with so many news around, where everybody's a writer and uh, just few of them are readers, uh, I think it takes much more um, challenge to get the right information out of this. And uh, this is probably the challenge also to many other European, and not only European, I would say also transatlantic partners, to try to figure out what is the truth and what is the lies. Mm. And uh, our opponents will definitely use this, because it's not just about military strength. If they can fragment society politically or, or with uh, different uh, concepts of, of right or wrong, or simply mess up so nobody knows what is right and wrong, then it's already half victory on their side. So I think that uh, here again, Probably being here at the border, we are a good, uh, good uh, example or uh, checking ground for other European countries how to be better prepared and, and more resilient to different challenges which are coming with so-called hybrid threat to our organization, NATO. Yeah. Thanks very much. This is a really impressive effort as uh, what you described done by the people of this country, not only by the political system. That's really, uh, as I said, it's really impressive to, to hear what you have done. And this is all kind of based on a, on a bottom-up approach very much. Mrs. Kramkambauer, what's the domestic debate in Germany about all these things? Could you give us a, an idea about that? Yeah. When it comes to the, the, to the domestic uh, discussion in, uh, in Germany, the situation is uh, quite different. Why is this so? I think you have to understand that after the reunification, after the end of the Cold War, there are other, other issues that we have to, to deal with. There was the reunification between Bundeswehr and the army of uh, East Germany. Um, then there was uh, the um, conflict on the Balkan. After 9-11, there was the war against um, uh, terrorism, our en uh, engagement in, uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, in this time, the view of the, the need and the use of collective defense um, become, became more and more less, and we spent each, uh, each year, we spent less money to this mm. issue. And when it comes to 2014, after the Russian aggression against uh, Crimea, uh, then there is a an, an change in the, in the domestic discussion in Germany. And it was the, the effort of Ursula von der Leyen and uh, that um, since then we, are, we have increasing um, and uh, spent much more money for our, um, uh, for our def uh, defense in, in Germany. But we had a lot to do and so we are, we are not uh, quite near the 2% two, uh, two that we have agreed with, uh, we are in the near of 2.5%. Um, um, and so um, we have to deal with a uh, public opinion that is not used to see a an, an leadership, a certain leadership, political leadership and military leadership mm. uh, of Germany. And we have uh, to deal um, with a situation in Germany that uh, there is a perception of Russia and uh, Russian politics which is quite different from the perception uh, here in the Baltic states. And this is uh, one of uh, the problems to explain why it is so important for us, for um, our soldiers from the Bundeswehr, to be here in the Baltic states, why it is so important to spend more money on collective defense um, and why it is so important to remain critical to the Kremlin. Um, in, uh, in, in, on, on this uh, point of view, um, I think we could um, learn from the, the Baltic states and um, it could be um, 
it could be necessary and useful in the domestic discussion um, to discuss the point of view of Baltic states of uh, the, the northern and, and, and eastern situation um, to come to the right decisions and uh, to come to more efforts uh, when it comes to our, uh, our defense. So we try to bring some good best practice and good arguments back home yeah, to Berlin. So. We already and buy airplane tickets. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I guess the audience is waiting already. Uh, and I now, of course, want to open the floor to the people in the room. Maybe we start first here, the second up there, and the third, Julian, of course. You have to be in the first row. <laughs> first one here, please. I come from Moscow, from Russia. Uh, I am director of the Center for Euro-Atlantic Security of the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, GIMO. Uh, sharing most of the views which were expressed by the esteemed panel, I would like to remind that Russians are the largest European nation, with 120 million of Russians living in geographic Europe. Uh, Germans are only the second largest European nation, with 90 million. And uh, with all my respect to pizza and pasta, Italians are just uh, merely an uh, ethnic minority. And uh, my question is to you, sir. Uh, shall we organize between military and military a kind of staff exercise between the Russian military and the Baltic States military? Uh, how to de-escalate in case of the potential unintended military accident. Because the recent study of the Princeton University, which was done, uh, it is computer model of the potential nuclear war between Russia and the West. And it starts on the border between Russia and Baltics when the, by mistake, uh, uh, NATO pilot enters into the Russian airspace, and then the Russians who are on the exercise, they shut down the plane, and then in several hours we are at the brink of war. Nobody wants a war. Shall we organize a kind of uh, staff exercises to provide pauses for our politicians to negotiate in case of any military accident? Uh, would that be a kind of uh, step towards mutual understanding and avoiding an accident? Thanks. We started with a concrete proposal. That's uh, something I like very much. Second question up there, middle left. Yeah, raise your hand again. Yeah. Uh, Roman Kowalczuk, uh, Foundation East Center. My question I will address to Her Excellency Ms. Uh, Kramp Karen Bauer. And uh, it's related uh, to um, German uh, arms uh, exports uh, to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so I will remind uh, after the invasion to Crimea, uh, Rheinmetall uh, decided to supply uh, advanced uh, ground uh, combat simulation center uh, to Russia uh, that uh, enables to train uh, around 30 thousand troops a year, and uh, then uh, uh, Germany halted uh, arms exports due to the expanded uh, conflict, uh, and uh, also uh, halted uh, to Ukraine. Uh, so do you think um, this stance, at least towards Ukraine, will be changed after implementation of uh, Steinmeier formula now, and um, uh, do you think um, uh, uh, Germany, in this case, uh, demands uh, from Ukraine to recognize a tactical defeat. Thank you. Last question. Uh, you, you, are, you speak loud enough, you can do that. And what technology do we need in defense. I'm struck by the first panel. They talked about financial technology, information technology, and I want to get away from a sterile debate about 2% and, and all that kind of stuff on, 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 on hard military kit. It strikes me that 
the EU has a fundamental role to play in forging a deep public-private partnership to get all the players that we would need for a 21st century European defence, IT, FinTech, all these companies that would be involved, and see how we could organise what we have now for a more effective defence for Europeans. Because when we talk about hybrid and cyber and even hyperwar, it does strike me that we'll need far more partners than we traditionally have had, and that the private sector will have to play a much stronger role. Is it therefore not time to think more creatively about how we mount a 21st century defence of Europe? Because I'm convinced if we did, we could indeed generate the effects that such a defence would require. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for the first round. Um, so maybe I take Mr. Uh, Mr. Ludquist first, if you would like to respond to any of, of those questions uh, that have been <coughs> put on the table. First of all, about um, the defense system, the technology, and what, what we really need. Um, it's a combination of a lot of things. Uh, in Sweden, we, we have said that uh, jet fighter systems and the submarines are national security interests. And we are very proud of that we can produce these sort of weapon systems and that uh, had a great impact on our capability also. And uh, we are also in international partnerships around these uh, systems. Um, from our perspective, we need to invest all over the area in the, in the armed forces. It's the artillery systems, it's uh, everything from signal uh, naval vessels, it's uh, about how to invest in corvettes, it's how to invest in artillery systems, in motor systems, in mechanized companies all over the, the area. I think it's needed when we are upgrading now. But it's also important to develop cyber systems so we can defend ourselves when we are attacked. We have uh, 100,000 activities directed towards Sweden each year, and that's uh, from state actors, private companies from different sort of organizations. So, and we also have to defend ourselves around these uh, psychological phenomena. And uh, now we will start a um, state authority for psychological warfare, how to handle crisis with, with these sort of things. So, so I think we must work here in a broad spectrum. Uh, and I can tell uh, the Russian friend here, he asked the Bolts about if they can have staff exercises. I can say from the Swedish side, we are not interested in that. I can be very clear about that. And that's, that's because of the, uh, that Russia breaking international law. Don't respect international law. It's because of what's happened in, in, in Crimea, for example. So, so if a country behave like this and are the largest in Europe, broke international law, and that's the, that's the problem. And I think, and my government says, we must uphold the European Union sanction, sanctions toward Russia. And I think it's very important also to be clear around this, because if we not are clear around this question, nobody in the end of the day respect international law. And now we see how, how this will be broken. And, and that's the only way we have to, to have respect for, for, for sovereign states and their integrity. So, so that's our position. I will not talk for the bolts. Yeah. Mr. Papix, what's, what's the perspective of your country and the broader perspective that Julian brought up, but also on the palpable proposal that we had on the table? Well, um, uh, Peter spoke about respect. Look, let's make it clear. We are a border country with Russia, and uh, of course, for us, probably, it will be the most beneficial to have a good relationship with Russia because when there are peaceful times, we could benefit quite quickly and quite well with this. But uh, we also, we all must understand that uh, respect involves also the equal approach uh, for both countries. And uh, in that sense, we cannot build any kind of a relationship on, uh, let's say, a fundamental existential uh, values of our country. And that, that we don't see is uh, clearly understood, or I, will, I would rather say it is probably known and understood, but it is not implemented on the other side of, the, of our eastern border. Now, uh, regarding uh, how to improve the things, definitely we are always open uh, 
for possibilities to improve the relationship, which is not on the best uh, in, not in the best shape at this moment, but in order to do this, uh, either it is relationship between states or between people, you need a mutual trust. And uh, lately I have, at least as far as I was informed, at least two occasions of which I can bring to the audience. Uh, one occasion was where we have been inviting uh, Russian representatives and experts to check uh, on the implementation of Vienna documents. They did not arrive. Uh, another meeting was, um, and it was upon our invitation, another meeting was um, with uh, some other experts which uh, have been bringing a very um, nice presence uh, as a curiosity. These were tea caps, uh, which you, you know, um, once you fill with the hot water, then some pictures appear. And uh, in some way, it was a very good uh, um, uh, soft advertisement because on the one cap, you could see my old friend Lavrov telling that if you don't speak to Lavrov, then on the other cap is written, then you will speak to Mr. Shoigu. So, <laughs> of course, uh, such type of presence are definitely uh, only increasing trust between those experts of, of both countries. And, and uh, so um, my suggestion would be that even if we are very good here with the humor, uh, <laughs> Maybe we should try to find some other way. But uh, to be serious, uh, of course, we need to talk, but we also must understand that dialogue by itself is not a policy. So uh, we need also to see that we can reach some agreement on anything and we can stick to this agreement because we are an old Hanseatic country and we know what this international law means. And for small countries, you know, law is highly important. So that's probably the solution if we can trust then we can talk, and if we talk, we must know what we want to reach. And that might be beneficial for both sides, not only for one side. So I think formula is very simple. Now, regarding uh, Julian's question, uh, there's a lot of things, and also Peter mentioned a number of them, but uh, I will mention something else from my experience, uh, let's say personal experience, uh, and also from experience uh, by implementing our comprehensive defense system. It's very important that we have a good dialogue with uh, high-tech companies, with internet companies, mentioned just like, you know, Instagram or Facebook, etc. And uh, we have been trying to see, and I'm not accusing yet, but I guess we might get to the data as well, we can try to see that uh, once they are talking to public, they are telling, yes, we will implement that uh, security measures and those security measures to, to strengthen the security for individuals, uh, for democratic systems, for voting system, etc. But once it comes to praxis, then actually it's much easier to stop in a Facebook or Instagram somebody who is honest, and they are frequently stopped. But once you're coming to fake accounts, once you're coming to the fake news, once you're coming to interferences where Facebook or Instagram or, or boots are used, you can knock on the door on these companies, if not for ages, then for months, and there is no whatsoever responses coming, neither to our government nor to some other institutions. So I think if we want a good cooperation, we need this cooperation with such type of industries, and those industries finally must understand that they have to be in a good touch with the governments of these countries, especially if they are the democratic countries. Perfect. Mr. Trump Kahnbauer, I understood the question, are we going to change our policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? Yeah, first of all, when it uh, to the Ukraine, um, when it we have strong rules when it comes to um, the kind of um, exportations that you mentioned, and um, we we will analyze and watch the situation in the Ukraine, um, and we are part of the Minsk format uh, and. Um, in this format, we work hard and we try to get some progress in an, in an, in a certain peace approach. And if there is a change and uh, if there are um, progresses, um, then um, uh, we have another view of the situation in the Ukraine, and then perhaps we can come to other um, decisions uh, um, uh, on, the, on the kind of um, exportations. But it depends on the progress in the Ukraine itself. And um, I think um, we should watch what uh, the, the progress, what the ideas um, that now um, are um, 
that now are discussed um, uh, in uh, the Ukraine um, will uh, will get um, for um, um, oh I lost the word <laughs> um, ergebnisse results. results so I have it found yeah so. okay perfect happy to take a second round that was Swen up there the lady in one of the last rows up there and Somebody in the, the man with the red tie. <laughs> well, thank you very much, thank you, ministers. Uh, wonderful panel, uh, Sen from uh, Estonia. Um, I don't think that um, the concept of uh, European strategic autonomy has been brought up. Uh, so I would like to ask all of you, um, what do you mean, or how would do you conceptualize European strategic autonomy? And more specifically, maybe, what do you mean in that con context by Europe? What is Europe, basically? The EU or wider? Uh, what do we mean by strategic? And what do we mean by autonomy? Is it autonomy of someone? Autonomy for something? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, have we a microphone up there for the lady? You may have to raise your hand again so that the people see you. They try to bring the microphone. Um, thank you so much. Um, the gentleman just told my question actually on strategic autonomy, so I'll, I'll use the opportunity to ask a question about the US because we're talking about the future of NATO and the US has been very little mentioned in this first session. Um, how do you see the changes coming from President Donald Trump? Do you think this is conjunctural? Do you think this is structural? And what does it mean for the security, the collective security in Europe? Thank you so much. Okay, so. Could you still identify yourself? Sorry, I'm Tara Varma. I'm the head of uh, the Paris Office of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you. And the last one here, fourth row. Hamid Um I want to thank the panelists for sharing their thoughts. Uh, my question is specifically towards the Minister of Defense of Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, within the context of the moderator's first question to you, uh, for better understanding, could you please explain uh, the German, Germany's security strategy uh, in light of military and energy policies and I'll give a couple of examples here. Uh, Germany now is spending, according to news reports, about 1.25% of their GDP uh, on defense. Uh, as you mentioned, 1.5% by 2024 and 2% 2 by 2031. Even though uh, back, I guess it was in 2014, the Wills Agreement was that they would reach 2% as soon as possible. I also recall, according to news reports, that a few years ago, Germany committed itself to spend 2% by 2024. Uh, now, why is this important, at least in terms of hardware? Uh, according to news reports, on uh, 2017, only four out of the 128 Eurofighters were operational. All six submarines were out of commission. Um, and on to uh, energy policy and Nord Stream 1 and 2, uh, Germany, at least at some level, is creating a dependency on Russian gas. I've heard about one-third of its energy dependence will be on that. Um, also, from another security point of view, but in a larger context, uh, when you have underwater uh, passage of gas, um, uh, pipelines, uh, if something goes wrong in these pipelines, uh, trying to fix them uh, t takes quite a bit of time, maybe up to one or two months, according to papers that I've read. And so it's not like land pipelines. That increases, again, the non-reliability of the source of supply. So given all of that I mentioned, if you could Give us, for sake of better understanding, what is behind the military and energy strategy of Germany? Thank you. 
Okay, perfect. So we have European strategic autonomy, we have the role of the US and how do we evaluate it, and a little bit about German security and energy. Who would like to start? First. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, very good question about uh, strategic autonomy, because um, whenever we engage in any discourse, I think it, we have to be clear uh, what do we mean with this and what is the definition. And uh, the first question that rises to me once I hear the word strategic autonomy, to which I am skeptical, is uh, autonomy from whom? We are not enough independent from our friends. We want more autonomy from somebody who is already in our NATO group. So why should we need, need to be more autonomous uh, in a political sense? So this is a bit ironic, but I don't think that uh, this is a very sorry to say, a very great concept uh, as far as uh, uh, definition is concerned. Uh, on the other hand, if I would like to interpret it in my positive way, that strategic autonomy would mean uh, more resilience and more military capabilities for European countries, then, of course, I would agree with this, because I think that uh, we are not sufficiently uh, financed and we are not sufficiently capable by ourselves uh, as European nations on our continent. And that, I think, goes hand in hand with another question about uh, United States presence. First of all, I think it is in all our interests that our transatlantic ties are very tight and close. And secondly, uh, no matter what somebody is telling once uh, they speak about necessity or not necessity to pay those 2% for each NATO member state for, for uh, our uh, defense. But uh, it's clear that 2%, at least for the Latvian country, or Latvia, is uh, the minimum necessity to provide us with that fundamental security, what we can do ourselves. And this is also not enough. And uh, we know that uh, it is not only President Trump they have been all previous United States presidents always reminding to their NATO allies that they are not contributing enough for their defense. And if I'm going to Washington or any other country, I think it's just legitimate that uh, American society, American citizens, should not pay for our security if they see that we are not paying ourselves. So we have to do our homework. We here in our region, we are doing our homework, and I think other nations should do just the same. And uh, once we do this, we would have capabilities, we would have resilience, and we would not have a need to talk about any kind of strategic autonomy because we will be quite independent and capable to make our own decisions. So from our perspective, there's no need for new institutions. For too much talk, we have to do something. Mr. Uh, thank you for this question about strategic European autonomy. Um, we see it from that perspective, if we try to build security together with exercises, with the developing of different sort of weapon system, with information sharing, with um, develop interoperability, we will be stronger together. And if we are stronger together, we can also handle crisis in a better way. And that can be one way of what we can call European autonomy. But we also need, in that perspective, the transatlantic link to the United States and also to Canada. So I think that, um, from our perspective, European autonomy don't have the meaning to cut the link over the Atlantic Sea. It's, uh, in our strategy, that is a main factor. And I can say that we have the last year developed uh, our co co cooperation with, with the United States with uh, an agreement statement of intent about material exercises, uh, uh, sharing of information, international operations and interoperability. And what I can see, what we have agreed upon between our countries and also Finland, Sweden, United States, they have delivered what we have agreed upon. So I, I cannot say anything negative about that. Then, then I also have noticed different sort of activities on the international arena and also mm. the tweet, tweets. But from our perspective, what we have agreed upon that has also been valid and in reality. And 
uh, we are also in the European Union and try from a, our perspective that to think that defense question is primarily national responsibilities. So we work together with other European nations from a national point of view that the right to decide about defense question is a national responsibility. Uh, so from that position we try to act in, in these different sort of programs that, that we have in the European Union and we are also in some sort of direct projects when we are cooperating with, with others. Uh, and then I think also it's very important to support and uh, also develop uh, the European Union's international missions and we have been in them for a long time. Uh. Just for the next round of questions, I'd like to get... Ms. Kramkramba will also answer. I'd like to get the gender balance right, so happy to take questions also from the female side of this. But now it's Ms. Kramkramba. Yeah. Um, I thought that um, in the past we spent uh, over uh, a long distance um, less and less money uh, to our um, defense and uh, to um, our material situation, personal situation uh, in the Bundeswehr. Um, but quite now we are working very hard to restrain our capabilities uh, and our contributions. And therefore, we need more money. Therefore, we fight uh, in the budget discussions in, in the Bundestag, in the parliament, um, to get more money to, to reach the 2.2% uh, uh, um, that we uh, have agree, uh, agreed in, uh, uh, in Wales. And um, when it comes to um, energy politics, um, we decided to, to leave energy that comes from nuclear power plants. That is a national, um, a, a national consensus in, uh, in Germany. And now we, we will quit um, uh, energy that comes from um, coal. Um, coal, yeah. yeah. Uh, coal uh, energy plants, um, it's uh, because of uh, uh, climate change. And um, we are working on, an, uh, on a very strong uh, energy mix uh, with a lot of uh, renewable energies. And there is no, de depend we, we don't depend uh, uh, just on uh, Russian gas. There is part of our mix and um, we, um, uh, we work uh, hard to get um, renewable um, energized uh, um, uh, um, uh, sources, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, uh, sources um, to, um, to don't uh, depend uh, on, on Russian gas. And um, when it comes to the question about U.S. St uh, strategy and uh, Europe uh, defense politics, I think um, U.S. is and remains our strongest partner in the NATO. Um, this is for me, it's, it's, it's rock solid. And we want to um, prevent this, um, um, this friendship and this partnership. And but we have to, to, to see that maybe there will be international conflicts that will have an impact on European interest rather than on NATO interest. Three days ago, I, I came from, uh, um, from the Saal region, mm. um, from Mali, and I think um, there are more problems for the European uh, uh, countries and the European um, um, uh, community than for um, the U.S. side. And in these situations, I think and I'm deeply convinced that we need a an, an European uh, pillar within the NATO that is, um, uh, that is strengthened than the situation today. And um, there are projects uh, in, in there we uh, are working together um, PESCO uh, uh, is, uh, uh, um, um, there are examples, PESCO, for example, in the uh, cyber uh, security. We are working together. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of progress 
uh, in uh, to do more on the European uh, side uh, for an uncertain European uh, defense politics, but it has to be a part of the NATO and not uh, an alternative to the NATO defense politics. So next round of questions. Can't, difficult to decide. I start here. And then I have to go over to the to the right side, possibly a little bit, over there. And last one <laughs> in the middle. Okay. Thank you. I'm the Mr. Sebastiano Fulci, the Italian ambassador here in Riga. And I have a question to the Swedish Minister of Defense. Um, he's been talking a lot about interoperability. So I just wanted to, to praise uh, the training activities that enhance interoperability that are going on here in Latvia, in Adagi, uh, where 11 nations are together. And among these 11 nations belonging to EFP, uh, <clears throat> there are Europeans mostly coming from the south. Uh, there are 350 Spaniards, 170 Italians, and then Albanians, Montenegro, Slovenians. Uh, a huge presence of a huge solidarity from southern Europe. And I'm sure that the Swedish troops would actually benefit from training here in Latvia with another 10 nations. That would also counterbalance you know, this, this preponderant presence of soldiers from Southern Europe. <laughs> um, another aspect I think I'm really curious about is uh, the debate in Sweden about joining NATO. Because let's face it, the real deterrence uh, comes from the nuclear presence at sea from, you know, UK, France, US. Um, this nuclear deterrence is, is, is quite important. And by the way, I wonder, with the melting of the ice in the, north, in the Arctic, whether there will not be more pressure coming from Russia in this area, from the naval nuclear point of view. So I think also maybe the debate about joining NATO and, and having you know, a full protection from, from NATO uh, is, is quite paramount in what's been said. Thank you. Thanks very much. Second question up there, exactly. The man with the booklet in his hand. Yeah. Could we get a microphone up there? That would be great. Lina Spakutka, uh, Baltic Defense College. The question uh, goes to the Swedish Defense Minister. Uh, sir, uh, you, you mentioned it's regarding the staff exercise what, uh, uh, with, with Russia. Sir, you mentioned uh, the key word here is uh, uh, the international law, the respect of international law. So my question would be, I just would like to see the drawing, the parallel with what's going on in Syria. And I would like to know the Swedish point of view, because still the Assad's government is uh, recognized by UN. And uh, you know, now the Turkish uh, just invaded the Syria's, Syria's territory. So what would, be, uh, what would be the Swedish point of view on this in frame of uh, the international law? Thank you. Thanks very much. And last question in the middle. The young man in the middle. Can you pass the mic? Yes. I'm uh, Vlad, I'm Ukrainian student, and today we're talking about uh, safety, about defense, and we're talking about common foreign and security policy also. And as you know, due to Article 24 of Treaty of European Union, uh, common foreign security policy includes uh, framing common defense policy, which might lead to common defense. And my, my question, 
if European Union eventually develops this policy, where will it stand in relation to NATO? Uh, won't uh, there be a competition in competence? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I think most of the questions went to Sweden, so maybe Mr. Hoodquist, you may want to start. If we, if we start with the last question, there is an agreement between European Union and NATO about um, that we should cooperate around cyber and hybrid questions. And um, the military side of it will be handled by, by NATO and, um, and um, the activities we already had in European Union will be handled there. And uh, Sweden supports that agreement we already ha have. About uh, Syria, our foreign minister have been very clear around that uh, what's happened now with uh, the Turkish aggression and invasion towards the uh, northern part of Syria is against international law and uh, she has condemned it. So we are very clear in our view and we have also taken an initiative that we in the European Union should have an embargo connected to weapons towards Turkey. About um, support for joining NATO in Sweden, I think we have a broad majority for not joining NATO and not change the Swedish security doctrine. And I also think that we should see that if we do anything about um, to, to change our security doctrine, it also has a direct impact on Finland. And Finland is our closest partner, and I have described that before, and we must also see to each other when we handle these sort of questions. And I think the most balanced way we can handle this question is to do what we are doing now together. And our strategy is to cooperate with other countries in the Western world and in Europe in exercises, information sharing, in different sort of activities that are well known and that we talk openly about. And then keep our platform for, for security and not do anything new there. Uh, but there, it's also a fact that we are members of the Enhanced Opportunity Programme in NATO and that we want to have that sort of high-level connections. We are involved in many, many international exercises and that it's very clear around who, which countries participate in every exercise. And we see that as a very important because every exercise is a part of this balance that we have in our part of, of Europe. And before we participate in any exercising or training activities, we make agreements about that and then afterwards we talk about it. So, so this is a question we come back to if we do it. But from a general point of view, and that's well known, we are very interested in to exercise with other countries, other like-minded countries, and that's no secret. Thanks very much. There were questions about European possible framing of a common defense policy. There's a lot of things that could be said about that. Not sure you want to dip into that. Okay, I will try to dip in that. Um, look, um, I think it's not so much important how do we discuss different types of institutions. For us here, it's important what is the practical result of this. And uh, definitely, this is an already very old discussion about what should do EU and what should do NATO. I would say that uh, at this moment, with the development of new technologies uh, with uh, changes in, in our societies and this interaction between human behavior and new technologies. I think actually EU has a number of opportunities where they can assist to NATO, which I consider as a major framework for security in European continent and transatlantic uh, area anyway. So there should not be a challenge. But if we really want to find out for uh, European Union uh, tasks, there are plenty of them, just we have to do this. And uh, this goes regarding the external border security of European Union, Frontex, etc., because that's it where we are very far from the good result. Uh, 
And this is not only about search and rescue, this is about the security of borders, first of all. Secondly, it is everything which is going together with communication lines, strategic communication, fake news, etc. This could be easily also tackled from the European Union without taking away something from NATO, or rather in correspondence and cooperation with NATO. Thirdly, of course, there are always numbers of things that we can do as far as cybersecurity and engagement with different international companies, large companies, as I mentioned, Facebook, Instagram, and etc., Google. Uh, if we think again on the hard security matters, I would like to leave it in the, in the hands of NATO uh, because we have not extremely good experience with European uh, Union uh, battle groups, which we created, but they are on the paper because this is a question about political decision making and there will be no, in the nearest time, anybody in uh, Europe who would be able to decide on behalf of sovereign nations as far as the military engagements and concerns are at stake. Uh, so, uh, you probably did not mention, but you might ask a question also about uh, European army. I think European army is a dream. And uh, we have no time for such type of dreams. We have to do a real work and then dream about something rather visionary in different uh, areas. Um, as far as uh, EFP presence and, and uh, ambassadors, thank you for question. Um, we already have a certain number of exercises together with our Swedish colleagues. There have been landings of your, of your planes in our airports, military airports, and etc. But of course, uh, unfortunately, there are limitations for our cooperation since at the end, even if cooperation between NATO and uh, means respectively also Latvia from this side and Sweden from another side is very deep and it's very good. Uh, we still have a certain questions and, and problems which we cannot solve until Sweden is not a full-fledged member. And this is regarding the exchange of information, this is regarding the communication lines, and this is regarding also military planning. Because until we can't fully exchange with our, how to say, NATO secrets with each other, even if we are a good friends, we cannot make a common planning, and then I have to pose from time to time the same question what I did to your uh, respectful excellency speaker of Swedish uh, Riksdag today. If the hypothetical crisis is coming, what exactly you as the Swedes will do? And I have no answer to this. We have a solidarity among Swedish population. We know what Karl Bildt has been telling and other politicians, but I don't have an answer what exactly you will do. And we know what exactly NATO can do and should do, but we don't know what Sweden will do. Okay, let's go. I, come think it's all I can good. comment here. <laughs> <laughs> but don't okay. tell all your secrets now. Now, now, now starts <laughs> yeah, the yes. interesting part, please. Yeah. He, he go ahead. Use, he using the moment now, because what will NATO do in an in a crisis situation, you cannot answer me exactly of that question because it's connected to the crisis scenario and it's different options to act connected to what's happened. And that is the same for Sweden and it's the same for interoperability. If we discuss a crisis, it can be so many things that are a crisis situation. And I think the main question is, if we exercise together, if we try to develop interoperability together, it's easier to decide what we do in a real situation. So exercises is not a thera therapeutic thing, it's a real thing that can be used if we are in that situation. But, have li but if, if anybody to tell me that they know exactly what they do in a crisis situation, I don't believe them because we don't know how is the scenario. And that is the problem with these sort of discussions. But you will do immediately in a real thing. We will do, we will do, we will answer that question when we see the problem. But you have the answer before you see the problem and I will congratulate you for that. <laughs> I think this will be a very interesting dinner. Try to get that table. <laughs> last, last question comes from over here. Please. Thank you. Uh, Gülsün Erkul, I'm the ambassador of Turkey to Latvia. 
Actually, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, thinking that I will have more questions. I have to interview more, so uh, it's, then I, will, I thought that uh, it's, it's, uh, I will enjoy the, of being an ambassador actually in an ally country. I just would like to make a small intervention, and uh, if the participants would like to comment on it, of course, it will be welcomed. I just would like to make an uh, equation. Uh, what we did, the operation in Syria, if you want to understand it, the PKK is a terrorist organization for European Union, NATO, US, for everybody. And it's, it's a fact that YPGPAD is a terrorist organization also directly linked with PKK. It's not questionable. And this operation, which started yesterday, the Peace Spring operation is not against Kurds, not against Arabs. It's just, it's an operation, and it's just against the uh, YPG, PhD, the terrorist organization. And if you're going to ask that, what will happen to, because I know the questions in your mind, and if you're going to ask that, what will happen to the Daesh there, uh, the Daesh prisoners, ISIS prisoners there, uh, actually Turkey is the only NATO ally who is fighting chest to chest with Daesh. Till now we uh, fought with almost 3,000 Daesh there, and believe me, it's, it's a, Daesh is a threat more to Turkey than anybody else. So of course, I mean, of course we will be responsible from the Daesh movements there, the, the, the terrorists there. So uh, to fight with Daesh, instead of trusting a terrorist organization, what we are expecting from our allies and friends is trust the NATO ally to fight with them. And if you're gonna say that, of course, everybody is for a political solution, and uh, Turkey is the only country, actually, who is very actively working in the Astana process. And now we are really running after the Constitutional Committee of Syria to be established, and of, I hope that it will be established. It will be, it will the benefit of Turkey most, actually. So uh, I just would like to, you know, I, I, I don't want to take much of time. I want to say a lot, but I don't want to take much of the time. But I just would like to underline the basics uh, understanding behind this operation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for bringing us back into kind of not only daily politics, but also very important strategic questions for the alliance. I indeed am running out of time now because I have been ordered to finish this in time and I will do this. So the very last question goes to the auditorium. Will the security situation in this region improve over the next five years or deteriorate? Who is in favor of improve? Raise your hands. Yeah. Yay. Who is in favor of deteriorate? So, and the rest is just already in the coffee break. So I don't, want to, I don't want to keep you away from that. Thanks very much to the panel. Thanks very much for being with us and for giving the opportunity. Thank you. Hmm.